New York City is defined by many characteristics, perhaps most noticeably by its extensive street grid, public transportation, and network of skyscrapers. But with the ongoing threats of climate change, housing shortages, and overall income disparities, could New York look different? This week, we explore New York's current infrastructure, as well as what its future could look like. You're watching Cheddar's Who Knew. I'm Hannah Ostapchak. What if the equivalent of over 1,300 football fields was added to the tip of Manhattan? That was the premise of an op-ed published in the New York Times earlier this year. There's evidence from all over the world that doing this can be a useful technique for crowded oceanside cities. Here's Cheddar's Karen Shedd with the story. What if we added the equivalent of 1,300 football fields to the tip of Manhattan? This was the proposal of a recent op-ed in the New York Times. Increase the borough by about 12% in order to mitigate two of the city's most pressing problems. Proposed by economics professor Dr. Jason Barr, the plan is admittedly a big ask for a city with lots of other problems. We knew, we knew going into this that we were going to ruffle some feathers. Um, but I think feather ruffling is important in the 21st century. There's evidence from all over the world that doing stuff like this can be really useful for crowded oceanside cities. But the process to do so, reclaiming land from the ocean, is rife with potential downsides. So is this a proportional response to gigantic problems or a zany harebrained scheme that will cause more harm than good? Land reclamation is the process of creating usable land from oceans, seas, or wetlands like marshes. Generally speaking, there are two ways to reclaim land. First, remove any water and replace it with rocks or dirt or sand, possibly with the help of supporting dikes. Or second, just, just chuck a bunch of rocks, dirt, or sand in there until you reach the top of the water. It's a technique that's been used to both create space and protect against encroaching seas for thousands of years. Floating dredgers pump and dump a mixture of sea bottom sand and water until a new piece of real estate is there for the selling especially in really low-lying areas. Well, the, the Netherlands is low land. <laughs> They're much of their land is like below sea level, you know. So if you're going to have a city below sea level, you got to figure out a way to protect that, <laughs> protect it <laughs> against the sea. Which explains the general Dutch Twitter reaction to Dr. Barr's proposal. I saw a bunch of, uh, of tweets from people in the Netherlands, and they're like, we can do this in five minutes. I mean, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. Like. This is not a big deal. Places like Boston and Mexico City have been reclaiming land for centuries, but the first big modern land reclamation projects started in the Netherlands in the 1970s, and it quickly became trendy around the globe. Really trendy. Here are the top three land reclaimers by square miles. And, of course, football fields. I should clarify, I mean American football fields. <laughs> I'm sorry to the entire rest of the world. Tons of countries in Asia have spent much of the 21st century in a land reclamation boom, especially, again, those in really low-lying areas. Much of lower Manhattan itself actually used to be swampy wetlands until the Europeans arrived and immediately started filling it in. As soon as the Dutch arrived in the 1620s, they started, <laughs> they started draining the wetlands, they started expanding the shorelines. And Much later was this plan, originally proposed in 1911, to add more than 32,000 acres to New York, or 24,000 football fields. Which makes Dr. Barr's 1300 football field proposal seem downright manageable. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that I haven't yet revealed which two problems could be addressed by doing this. In short, the critical housing shortage and the threat of rising oceans. And in long, you'll just have to watch to find out. So here's current Manhattan, and here's Dr. Barr's proposed Manhattan 2.0, or New Manahata an homage to the Lenape word for the area. New Manahata would extend about 2.6 miles from the current tip of Manhattan, absorbing Governor's Island en route. Extended subway lines from Manhattan and Brooklyn would connect the new land to the rest of the city, and the whole thing would be larger than the Upper West Side. Now, if you're thinking, boy, this sounds expensive, how are we going to pay for it? Fair enough, but Dr. Barr is an economist, so he has thought about this. So the reason why the economics can potentially work is because the actual market price is so much greater than the construction prices. And so the city could potentially capture that difference and use it to think big. It's like as soon as you make it, it's already worth a 
a gazillion dollars. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Just by virtue of the fact that it exists makes it incredibly valuable. Why? Because New York City is valuable. I mean, it's a global city, it's a productive city, it's a fun city. With its proposed 178,000 new housing units, Dr. Barr's dream outcome is a new neighborhood that's welcoming to all income levels with an emphasis on public transit, walkability, and cycling. Not to mention a major relief for a hugely overcrowded city. Here's where it gets especially interesting. Making this much more Manhattan would push vulnerable areas like Broad and Wall Streets further inland, but not in a sacrificing the people who live on New Manhattan to save Wall Street kind of way, because they too would be protected. First, by elevating the new land 13 to 15 feet, which is higher than the highest flooding of Hurricane Sandy. And second, by this strip of green right here. That green strip is the piece de resistance of New Manahata, wetland ecologies. Creating wetlands, you can create natural buffers for storm surges. Rather than having just, you know, the, the water and the land, if you have some kind of intermediate zone, it could absorb a certain amount of the, the storage, storm surges as they come through. Of course, where there are harebrained schemes, there are also big potential downsides. Dredging is causing permanent changes to current systems that carry developing fish and coral through the marine ecosystem. Land reclamation can be environmentally devastating. Marine life can become either displaced or destroyed entirely. In particular, the New York, New Jersey Harbor has only recently become clean enough to welcome back an old friend, the humpback whale. And that's just the most visually obvious example of the harbor's recovered biodiversity. At this point, you might be wondering, this guy's an economist. Why is he recommending something that could be so potentially devastating when it's outside his area of expertise? And it's a criticism that Dr. Barr is very familiar with. There's any any number of reasons why there are ecological problems. I get that. I mean, I'm not unsensitive to the potential harm, but we are facing drastic problems. The reaction to this piece was mixed. Dr. Barr says he got generally positive feedback from fellow economists and generally negative feedback from ecologists. Makes sense. Comments on the New York Times website were critical is a nice word for it. Twitter had the most fun takes, including some approving Dutch people, and many people pointing out that New York is not exactly known for its speedy completion of infrastructure projects. But for now, it's just a proposal, like several other proposals to expand or fortify other parts of the island. Like this one in East River Park, which is currently causing a massive public backlash. So for now, whether it's worth taking seriously or not just depends on your perspective. New York City's geography makes it particularly at risk to the impacts of climate change, like rising seas and subsequent flooding. Cheddar's Chloe Aiello explains the city's plans to protect itself from flood walls to levees to even redesigning its coast. By 2050, sea levels along much of the U.S. coastline are expected to rise by at least a foot and are on track to rise to an average of six feet by 2100. This spells trouble for the nearly 40% of the U.S. population that live near the coasts especially those who live in New York City. This is what the city could look like if water levels rose by three feet, six feet, nine feet, and 15 feet. By the six foot mark, the sea could swallow 20,000 acres of land, including 52 subway stations and 18 power plants. These projections spurred the city into action. New York has a plan to protect itself from rising seas, but is it enough? On October 29th, 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City hard. Over the next 48 hours, two million people lost power and 44 lives were lost. Then, almost a decade later, Hurricane Ida and ensuing flash floods dumped a record-breaking 10 inches of rain on the city in September alone. And the situation is only projected to get worse. New York City's geography makes it particularly at risk to the impacts of climate change. A substantial portion of its lands are low-lying, some even built on landfill. One of the first problems the city has is it has 600 miles of coastline, and so it is very vulnerable to sea level rise and to any 
impacts that would be coastal in particular. So the city has been investing in critical infrastructure projects to make it more resilient against future storms. Projects like the $1.45 billion Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan. Kicked off in the fall of 2020, the project aims to protect the city's most vulnerable stretch of land, Lower Manhattan. First, by raising the East River Park by 8 to 10 feet, and second, by installing a 2.4-mile flood protection system made up of barriers like flood walls and flood gates along the East River. The neighborhood that this project is adjacent to is over 110,000 uh, vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, and so it's critical that we start to uh, really prepare the city and prepare these neighborhoods for increased coastal storms, sea level rise, um, and all of the other impacts of climate change. It's set to finish in 2026. Climate change is a, it's a new thing that we're all facing together as a community and the more people can kind of step back a little bit and recognize that these are the big kind of hard moves that we're gonna to have to make in the coming decades. Then there's Hunters Point South Park in Long Island City, which sits on a former industrial site. Hunters Point South is a great example of kind of how you can integrate resilience into a fantastic park space really well. Completed in 2018, the park features rain gardens, salt marshes, and a lawn that can hold 550,000 gallons of stormwater runoff. So there are features that are just built in across the park that intermingle with nature and that, are, that you can use on a sunny day for recreation, but then they have that stormwater or storm surge purpose. Not only does Hunters Point South Park shore up Long Island City against the effects of extreme weather, some features actually mitigate climate change. We've got grass, we've got trees, we've got the, the salt marsh. Those have a, a carbon capture ability, and, and salt marshes in particular are actually better than forests at capturing carbon. Resiliency efforts like these haven't stopped at parks. Other neighborhoods have added flood protection methods to existing infrastructure. Like in southern Brooklyn's Canarsie, which was hit especially hard by Hurricane Sandy. Over here, most of us, our basements was full. I couldn't get into my garage because everything had tumbled over. But the people on the other side, like say 105, those people, their basements was five and six feet of water. Okay, we had three and a half feet over here. I stayed on top of it. I went to meetings after meetings and I was working. I used to leave my job and go to different meetings, parks department meetings, DEP, DEC. I didn't know nothing about this engineering stuff that they was talking about. But because I wanted to know what we could do for Kanasi, okay, my community, I was there. Tireless efforts by the community didn't go unnoticed. And in October 2021, the state invested $14 million into the Fresh Creek Coastal Protection Project. Canarsie's Fresh Creek dumps water into the sewage system in the event of storms or high tides. This, combined with the overflow coming from the creek itself, results in even more flooding. So the restoration project aims to build tide chambers that would block seawater, trash, and debris from entering the existing sewer lines. The purpose of it is to maintain and uh, control the flow if any high tide event, you know, in the case of Hurricane Sandy, Ida, whatnot, we want to make sure that the water is entering the storm sewer system in a steady and a controlled manner. The infrastructure investments that we're making here prevent the kinds of infrastructure failures that we've seen from these floods like Sandy, these storms like Ida just last year. And so it will protect Canarsie from flooding and for decades into the future will keep Canarsie resilient. The project is scheduled to wrap up in fall 2022. But these projects might just be the start. So a lot of what we have done is first fought the last war, which was Hurricane Sandy, and we're prepared for the next one. But it's hard to tell where the next threat will be coming from. If climate change doesn't slow, New York City will need to build mega projects, like the New York Harbor Storm Surge Barrier, a $119 billion six-mile seawall proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers. It will use retractable gates to protect people, properties, and landmarks from storm surges without cutting off the city from the waterfront. 
Even so, many environmental experts are concerned with the seawall. They say that the barrier addresses only storm surges and not other climate-related threats, like flooding from high tides and storm runoff. It could also trap sewage and toxins detrimental to the city's waterways. In order for the Army Corps to get the go-ahead, New York City, New York State, and New Jersey would all have to approve construction and foot 35% of the bill. While these plans and proposals aim to fight off rising sea levels and intensifying storms, their biggest focus should be on protecting the nearly 8.5 million people that make up one of the world's major cities. The environmental conditions that New York City faces are all solvable by the application of technology to the problem. It's a question of whether we're willing to invest. We have to got to start thinking a little bit ahead of the game and prevent the problems from happening. So uh, New York City is going to be around. Uh, and uh, if it starts to sink, we'll figure out a way to pump it up. Guaranteed. And it wouldn't be New York City without some of the world's tallest towers. With demand for luxury high-rise vistas booming, building developers are using every zoning opportunity they can to push height limits, including one technically tricky loophole. Here's Cheddar's Joseph Ruddleston with the story. Skyscrapers. They're the pride of any city skyline. Poking out of the horizon like glorified pins in Earth's cushion, these majestic displays of humanity's engineering heights have given us the iconic skylines we recognize so well today. Huh. That's new. And that one. Wait. Oh, f It's tall as f And it's how much? New York is seeing some of the tallest, thinnest residential buildings in the world cropping up around Central Park. Built not for the rich, but for the ultra-rich. The penthouse of 432 Park Avenue is listed for $169 million. One of the unique selling points? They're very, very tall. Taller than you'd expect them to be allowed. Buried somewhere in the labyrinth of New York's zoning laws, there's clearly something these developers know that we all don't. It's a loophole, see? Right around here, the insiders are using to make the most out of New York's complicated zoning laws. And with demand for these slender towers being higher than ever, the fight for the skyline has only just begun. New York City has always had a unique connection to skyscrapers, ever since elevators and steel frames made it possible to build so tall. But when the Equitable Building was built in 1915, the sheer base width and height of the building sparked an onslaught of criticism, with one critic at the Real Estate Magazine describing it as a monstrous parasite on the veins and arteries of New York. So the city passed the 1916 zoning resolution, which, along with height restrictions, required setbacks. That's how big buildings shaped like these came about, with those big step-like forms leading to a tower. As the city continued to build up through the century, an iconic skyline was forming, but by 1961, the setback style tower wasn't working for everyone. I think that the romance of the Pew Ferris style skyscraper disappeared and was replaced by a different vision of urban space. They revamped the old setback rules to a new solution called the Floor Area Ratio, the FAR. Depending on the location, a new building would be given a maximum floor area according to its ratio. All right, let's break this down. The city is divided into districts of varying floor area ratios from 1 to 10. So with an FAR of 10, you can build 10 times the floor area of the lot in whichever configuration you like, using the whole lot for a 10-storey building or just half for 20 storeys. Developers can transfer or buy the air rights of the lot next door and add them to their own building area. So if this building isn't making use of all these air rights granted to them by the city, they can sell to this project next door and make a decent buck instead. And that's why you've got these large towering skyscrapers next to these rather small, more conventional building heights. In the 70s, former President Donald Trump bought air rights from the Fifth Avenue's landmark Tiffany building, bringing Trump Tower from 20 stories way up to 58. He did the same thing 20 years later, this time with seven neighboring lots in Midtown, stacking them all into Trump World Tower. But something's happened in the 21st century that shifted skyscrapers into overdrive. Well, two things actually. First, developers have been combining the purchase of air rights with advanced structural engineering, stronger steel and cement, to push buildings to new heights while keeping the footprint small. And as a result, super thin towers have been appearing with no more warning to neighborhoods than a note on the scaffolding. Slenderness, especially in residential buildings, comes with its advantages. 
When you stack fewer apartments onto each floor, residents can enjoy panoramic window views. It really feeds into the luxurious exclusivity of the place. And with a small core where a lot of the costs go, developers save money. Overlooking Central Park, and known to everyone but the billionaires as Billionaires Row, they're some of the tallest residential buildings in the world, including 432 Park Avenue, way up at 1,400 feet. 432 was building five or six floors a week at one point, which is amazing for a reinforced concrete building. I'm not a novice, you know, this is part of my work. And I was like, what the hell is going on there? I was so surprised. I was like, that thing has got to be topping off soon. Designed by Raphael Vignoli Architects, the simple design was inspired, believe it or not, by a trash can. It became the tallest residential building in the world, needing plenty of air rights from its neighbors, but even those weren't quite enough to reach these dizzying heights. These floors right here are permanently unoccupied. 432, one of the reasons it's so tall is because they took the mechanical space and stuck it in there and it doesn't count towards the FAR. So you get these, from a zoning point of view, free lifts of space every time the mechanical floor comes through. Around a quarter of 432 Park Avenue's 88 floors are dedicated to structural and mechanical equipment. You can see these voids in other super tall buildings around the city. The upcoming Central Park Tower, reaching 95 stories tall, will have more than a fifth of its height unoccupied. The structural engineer for both 432 Park and Central Park Tower, Sylvian Marcus, said mechanical equipment space is necessary, and without structural voids, the towers would sway with the wind. Not an ideal feature, given that. But the use of these large voids has led to more extreme proposals. 432's architects had their hopes dashed after this 32-story residential tower on the Upper East Side was denied development because of 150 feet of mechanical space. As if the fire department didn't climb enough stairs. In 2019, the Department of City Planning passed a bill for residential towers requiring mechanical floors higher than 30 feet to count towards the total zoning floor area. The balance of regulation is a long laboured point of debate in New York City, with all sides insisting they want to change the city for the better. On one side you've got developers and architects looking to continue the city's unique and lucrative history of building tall. On another side you have the Municipal Art Society of New York, or MASS, as a non-profit organisation fighting to preserve the city's character with a thoughtful planning. They publish a series called Accidental Skylines, highlighting the effects these out-of-scale towers could continue to have on surrounding neighbourhoods. As for news publications, they generally share a common argument against these slender towers. Aside from the fact that none of the buildings added to Billionaire's Row has completed the city's safety requirements. An argument that's impossible to ignore is the trend's visual exemplification of wealth inequality in the middle of an affordable housing crisis. While making exceptions to the zoning laws continues to be a struggle for affordable housing developers with stacks of paperwork, it's become the norm for luxury projects. We very often end up making amendments to it for specific developments. Like we say, oh, we want to build this building here, so let's write this, let's amend the zoning resolution to allow this particular building to happen. We do it all the time now, like in New York City. We do it all the time. To this day, millions of square feet of available development rights cover New York. Mass has its eye on over a hundred tower proposals in the works. I don't know, I'm, I'm torn. I think to many people, those buildings represent that the city is vital, that there's energy, that there's a can-do attitude, etc. New York's fundamental identity comes out of this idea of as of right, where developers can not borrow but buy the constrained space, pile it up onto their lot, and create the opportunity to innovate with the commercial energy, the entrepreneurialism that has always been um, the, the symbol and the reality of New York. At the same time, those towers put an enormous uh, amount of pressure on urban infrastructure. Uh, we have yet to see what happens if there's a fire in a super tall, for example, especially with these voids. That one thing is for sure, you know, our capacity to build things has outstripped our ability to fully understand the consequences. That concludes this week's Who Knew? I'm Hannah Osapchak. Thanks for watching.